Hello and welcome back to my channel. I'm Paul Kalnitz, naturopathic physician and former professor of naturopathic medicine in Portland, Oregon. And this is a continuation of my salutogenic medicine series. This is part 16. And in this particular video, I'm going to discuss something known as the seven life processes. So we've looked at the sort of fourfold le levels of human organization, um, the so-called threefolding principle in the last video. And today I want to jump into the seven life processes. So again, a little bit about me. I'm a naturopathic physician, as I mentioned, and um, also have studied acupuncture and uh, Chinese herbal medicine and have been in private practice now for about 25 years or so and um, worked in a number of settings. And for many years, I was a professor at the uh, National University of Natural Medicine in Portland, Oregon. And um, I've done additional training in anthroposophically extended medicine, uh, data science and data analytics, and uh, also my following my interest in neuroendocrine immunology, cell signaling, and so forth. So the purpose of this channel really is to explore what I've been discussing as a salutogenic terrain model of health, which is in not opposition to, but sort of in contrast to our current biomedical model, which is based on more of a pathogenic cellular or molecular approach to uh, disease. So I'm trying to put forward a lot of ideas that we find in different sorts of what we call integrative or alternative medicines, for example, Chinese medicine and Ayurveda and so forth, but trying to bring it into a modern context. So if you study all those different traditions, they all have their various uh, different ideas and um, based on their own historical context and so forth. And my interest is developing more of a universal model that uh, we can use to not replace but extend conventional medicine conventional biomedicine so if you like the content of this channel feel free to share it of course and uh, like if you want to and then uh, if you subscribe there's a little bell you uh, bell notification you can uh, hit which will let you know when i post new videos i'm trying to do a new video every week or so so in the uh, last video and uh, you know over the course of several videos here I've been exploring this idea of the different levels of organization in the human being and um, have sort of approached this idea that in the biomedical viewpoint, uh, our current medical system, we usually use a what we call bottom up causation. So we start at the level of molecules and genes and cells, and then we build up from there to look at tissues and organs and organ systems to the whole human being. So again, the biomedical approach, phenomena such as life activities, but also consciousness um, and um, what we might call self-awareness or self-consciousness, all are thought to arise from the activities of molecules and genes, basically. Um, versus a salutogenic terrain model, as I've been proposing, uh, seeks to kind of start at the other end. So it starts with the whole human being and then works down in more of a uh, top-down type of causation um, and uh, focusing on the whole organism first and then going from that down into the parts. Now, there's a very interesting idea. This was uh, from uh, the author Arthur Kessler. He published a book in the late 60s called The Ghost in the Machine, where he proposed this idea of what he called holons or the holarchy. Now, holarchy basically is a whole system with subparts, but each part reflects the whole. And this is similar to the idea of maybe we might call a holographic field uh, when I discuss the kind of field concepts that I've been introducing here. But the idea that each level of a field uh, is a reflection of the whole. And so if we go from the whole human being down into the cell, we should see the same repeating levels of organization, just maybe on a finer and finer level. So that's going to be a very important idea to keep in mind as I go through this particular discussion. So I think a great place to start um, for looking at sort of a whole, a holistic or a whole person uh, centric viewpoint when we when we ta start talking about the physical body and the life activities is to start with embryology. Because in embryology, we see a really interesting phenomena where we start with a whole, a one essentially, which is essentially the fertilized egg, also called the zygote. Um, and in the fertilized egg, basically, uh, we um, have a one. So we have the fusion of the egg and sperm, each have 23 chromosomes, and we get the total complement of 46 chromosomes in the zygote. And in the first week, and this is occurring in the fallopian tube usually, um, before any sort of implantation into the uterine wall has occurred, in the first week, the zygote undergoes many, many cell divisions. 
and forms a little ball of cells called, usually called the morula. Looks like a little bag of grapes. Well, what's interesting about this is that the way this growth occurs is not in the way that you might think uh, of growth occurring. Usually when we think of growth occurring, we take one element and we maybe add it to another and that gives us you know, the second element. Um, so one plus one is two. But what happens in the um, zygote essentially is that the one divides itself into two, and then the two divides itself into four, and so forth. And so essentially we see this zygote is surrounded by a very thick sort of glycoprotein coating called the zona pellucida. And because of that glycoprotein coating, this ball of cells cannot grow. It simply divides internally through a series of steps called cleavage. And so this, um, this ball grows and grows, and then these cells become compacted within. But again, this is all occurring in the fallopian tube. There's no growth of this uh, future embryo here. It's just a dividing ball of cells. And then towards the end of the first week or so after fertilization, around day four, day five, um, this ball of cells begins to differentiate into two different types of cells, sort of an inner cell mass and then an outer uh, layer of cells. And what's gonna be important here is that the inner cell mass is going to actually form the future body of the embryo versus this outer layer of cells, the trophoblast, will form all the supporting tissues, the so-called chorion and the placenta and so forth. Uh, and then there's a sort of a hollow space uh, inside here filled with fluid. So again, this is still surrounded by the zona pellucida and um, this has not grown in size at all from the original size of the zygote. And then around day five, day six, um, up to day seven, is we essentially have the, uh, this ball of cells has moved now into the uterus and uh, it begins to move into the uterine wall. And right before that happens, the zone of pellucida essentially dissolves or a portion of it dissolves out and this uh, developing embryo hatches out of it. And uh, so now it's free to grow in size. Then it implants into the uterine wall. So this is the uterine epithelium here. Um, and then it begins to grow inwardly. And eventually it's gonna be surrounded by the entire ure uterine wall. And this growth is happening in the wall itself. This ball of cells then begins to grow larger and larger. And we see a differentiation in that inner cell mass, the one up here, now becomes two different types of cells, the so-called epiblast and the hypoblast. And then we still have the trophoblast on the outside. So what was one in the first week now has become essentially two, two layers of cells. Um, and uh, this is very clear by the end of the second week, we have a what's called a bilaminar germ disc. So these two layers of cells with two cavities on either side. One is called the amniotic cavity and the other is the yolk cavity here. And then there's a third cavity, the chorionic cavity surrounding all of those. So it's this bilaminar disc which will actually form the future body of the embryo. So again, we can think of this as like a leaf with two layers, top and bottom. Now, in the at the end of the second week, around day 12 or so, that leaf will develop a little groove on its surface and then cells will begin to move inward through a process which I mentioned before known as gastrulation. And this forms essentially three germ layers, the so-called ectoderm, the mesoderm and the endoderm. And those three layers will form all of the future tissues of the embryo, the nervous system, the digestive system, the heart, and so forth. Um, so that's essentially what we have here going into the second week. Um, this will continue to grow and we have these three sacs, again, the amniotic sac and fluid within, we have the yolk sac and fluid within, and then the so-called uh, chorionic sac on the outside. And then you see this little stalk, which is connecting that leaf-like structure, the future embryo, to the uterine wall, uh, and this will form the placenta here. And then into day 23 here, into the second, into the third week, uh, the structure continues to grow. So in the third week, we essentially have these three germ layers. The ectodermal layer, this outer layer here, it will form the future nervous system, the sensory system, system and all the sense organs, uh, like the lens of the eye and the parts of the ear and so forth, um, hair, and then the outer layering of the skin, the so-called epithelium, or the epidermis, I'm sorry, epidermis of the skin. And then that's the ectodermal layer. Then on the other side, forming out of the yolk sac, uh, 
There's another layer that develops, and that's the endoderm, and that will form the entire digestive system, including the liver and the pancreas and gallbladder, uh, as well as the inner layers of the lungs. The lungs are interesting. It actually, the lungs develop from the digestive tract. And then there's a third intermediate layer, the so-called mesoderm layer, which is shown in red here, which will form the, um, uh, the whole circulatory system, heart and circulation, uh, other layers of the lungs itself, the skeletal and the muscular system, as well as the urogenital system, so the kidneys, the bladder, and the reproductive organs. All of these will come from the mesoderm layer. Um, so this is in the third week, and that continues to develop. Eventually in the fourth week or so, the little sprouts for the limbs, the arms and legs develop. And then by the ninth week, we have a, an embryo that looks something like this. But there's a very clear sort of section that comes from the endoderm, which will form, uh, ectoderm, I'm sorry, which will form the future nervous system, uh, the brain and the spinal cord, as well as the other parts of the nervous system, such as the autonomic nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And then there's a little tube, the gut tube, which will connect to the mouth, while the digestive organs form. And then in the middle, we have a system of blood vessels, the heart, the urogenital system, and uh, again, all the muscles and the skeleton developed from this middle layer as well. So basically the image here is sort of a one, dividing, dividing, dividing. In week two, we have two layers, the bilaminar germ disc. In week three, we have the three layers, the three germ layers. And then in week four, we start developing the limb buds and whatnot, we begin to look more human. We might think of week one as sort of a mineral stage of development. Interestingly, you can take the morula out and you can freeze it. And in uh, many mammals, for example, deer, the morula will actually go into a stasis phase until the seasons are right for it to then go through the whole maturation cycle. Um, and then in week two, it's more of a plant-like existence with sort of a leaf-like bilaminar germ disc. In week three, we have more of an animal existence where there's the three germ layers, which will form all the future organs and other systems of the body. And then week four, we begin to look more like a human being in the embryo um, and so forth. So it's interesting how there's sort of a numerical progression, almost according to the week, uh, through which the embryo grows. But the image here is a one dividing into more and more parts, not so much one part adding on to another. So again, this is a very important process in life where one divides into two, there's a polarity between the two, then the three develops and so forth. So if we look more deeply at this embryonic development, we see some interesting phenomena connected here with the gut formation and the brain formation. So if you look at the three tubes I just discussed, the so-called neural tube, which is shown in blue in this picture here, the gut tube, which is shown in yellow here, and then the aorta and the heart and all the organs coming off of it, such as the urogenital system, um, that's in the middle here. And if you look at a cross section, you see three tubes, essentially the neural tube, um, the uh, gut tube here will form, uh, actually look at the bottom diagram here, the neural tube, the gut tube, and then the aorta forms in the middle. Um, the heart's a little complicated because actually it forms in the very, not shown in this particular diagram, uh, it actually starts to form nor the, towards the top of the head and only then moves inwardly during the uh, beginning of week three. So if we say, where does the cardiovascular system develop? It actually develops above the head, we might say, and then moves inwardly. Now, um, if you look at the neural tube at this end towards where the brain will develop, um, you essentially find three forming early on, three little swellings called vesicles. And uh, these vesicles are primary vesicles. Usually they're shown here in this picture. Um, there's a red one here that's, that's going to develop into what's called the hindbrain. And the hindbrain will contain structures like the medulla and the pons and the cerebellum. And then in yellow here, we have the midbrain, which will develop into uh, different structures. Um, and then we have the forebrain here, which will develop into the thalamus hypothalamus, uh, the, cere the cerebrum and the eye cup and so forth, the optic nerves and so forth. So these um, three little swellings will go, go on to develop into five different sections. And then eventually this will develop into all of the structures we know as part of the brain and uh, the upper part of the central nervous system. And the rest of the neural tube here will uh, develop into the spinal cord. 
and then there are secondary other nerves that will then come off in and out of that spinal cord as it, as it goes down. So that's the development of the neural tube. Well, similarly, there's a development of the gut tube into what is called the foregut, shown in this picture here, which will develop essentially into the esophagus, the stomach, the upper part of the small intestine, the duodenum, as well as organs like the pancreas, the liver will sprout off of that, the gallbladder, and so forth. And then the midgut, which will form the bulk of the small intestine. Uh, and there are drains, the veins draining that, which will all drain into the liver, so we can kind of connect the liver with the midgut as well. And then the hindgut, um, which will form uh, the lower part of the large intestine and the rectum and anus. So there's a threefold division that happens there as well. Now, it's interesting to look at this idea as inverse images of one another. And I introduced that last time that we can think of the metabolic system actually as a inverted neurosensory system and vice versa. So what we see in the upper part of the body concentrated in the head and the sensory organs is reflected in the lower part of the body in the system of intestines and metabolic organs and so forth. So if we look at the neural tube, we have the three divisions, forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain with spinal cord. And um, these um, all essentially are, um, um, you know, we could say they're solid. They, there are hollow spaces in the brain, of course, the so-called uh, cerebral ventricles. Um, but for the most part, the brain is solid as well as the spinal cord. You know, so we think of that as just being filled with material, basically, nerve cells and whatnot. In the gut tube, we have a hollow esophagus, and then the foregut, which will develop into the stomach, pancreas, liver, gallbladder, and then the midgut, which forms most of the small intestine, and then the hindgut, which forms the, we can just say for purposes here, most of the large intestine, although uh, part of the large intestine develops in the midgut as well. So, and these are hollow spaces. So there's sort of an inverted image but we can interestingly relate the hindbrain with the foregut, the midbrain with the midgut, and then the forebrain with the hindgut. Um, so we have a sort of an inverted image and we're beginning to find this whole series of connections through the nervous system, through the vagus nerve and other nerves between the foregut, the midgut, and the hindgut, and different portions of the brain. Essentially, you might think of all the metabolic organs as being mapped to different parts of the brain through sensory neurons. And that's research that is continuing, it's, it's ongoing as, as, uh, even now. So this is an uh, interesting idea that there's, again, a metamorphosis of the metabolic system into the neurosensory system and vice versa. And then standing between, we have the aorta, and we have the heart and circulatory system and the urogenital system. Now, organs like the spleen actually originate from this middle zone and they migrate into uh, into the foregut region. And then the urogenital system, the kidneys and the bladder, of course, also migrate into the metabolic system. Um, so there's a bit of a crossover going on there. So these things, these are just rough sort of outlines, but you can kind of see the general uh, tendency that's occurring here in embryonic development. Now, last time I introduced this idea of the polarity between the neurosensory system, the upper part of the body, focused in the skull, hard, protective outer covering with the brain tissue on the inside, with the openings for the sensory organs, and then more of a hollowed out center, the center of our metabolic organs uh, in the abdomen, and then a sort of middle zone, the thoracic zone, which in a way combines gestures of both these regions. So if we look at the head zone again, there is more of a rounded gesture and we say information is reflected from the outside in. And then in the metabolic zone, there is more of a linear gesture in the linear gestures of the, of the legs. Um, and, you know, when we ingest foodstuffs, we can think of the, the activities of those foodstuffs now radiating into the organism uh, outwardly. Um, so there's sort of opposite gestures here. And then in the thorax, there's a, there's a uh, the rounded gesture of the rib cage itself with the linear ribs. So it kind of combines both elements, the head gesture and the metabolic gesture. So this is again using a more of a phenomenological type of observation to look at the overall gestures in the, in the actual physical form here of the skull and looking if there's any patterns that we might see between them. We might think of the neurosensory region as the so-called nerve zone and then the metabolic organs really prepare the blood. So there's an old idea in traditional medicines that we have this balance between nerve activities and blood activities, and that health has to be uh, maintained by keeping those two in balance. And that's essentially what the 
oscillations of the heart beat and the respiratory uh, rhythm in the thoracic zone are doing is they're keeping a rhythm between the more neurosensory activity and the metabolic activity. And that gives you insight into, for example, a lot of cardiac disorders. They're not actually disorders of the heart itself, but disorders either of too much or too little nerve sensory activity or too much or too little metabolic activity. So the neurosensory system as a function, really, the activities are more focused on perception, integration of information, responses. So we might call this more the information system. And we usually in our, not our physiology, but in our soul life, our psyche relate the activities of the nerves more to thinking. In the metabolic system, this is where the essentially food is processed and brought into the blood for sustenance. And it's really where the energy that we create from substances occurs in great amounts. And so essentially, this is how we feed the muscles and whatnot. And this is the basis for our metabolism and our movement system. Um, this is working not so much information, but more with matter itself. And on the soul level, we might think of these organs as connected to the processes we relate to willing our will or action activity, which again gives interesting insight into the idea that uh, disorders like depression really are not a problem of the brain or the nervous system per se, um, but rather are issues involving the metabolic organs. Uh, and uh, they're either overactive or underactive in different cases. So I'll go into that discussion later. Um, and then finally, in the thoracic zone, we have the rhythms of the circulatory system and breathing. And this is really our transport and, and uh, sort of ability to move things around the body. And, and as I'll speak about here shortly, it's also the center where excretion, secretion is happening as well. We can think of all the endocrine organs, for example, secreting into the blood and the blood then moving uh, waste products to different organs for excretion or elimination. On the soul level, these rhythms relate more to feeling life. Now, I introduced this more in depth last time, so I won't go into this discussion too much here, but these three processes, thinking, feeling, and willing, we might say are the threefold or fundamental processes of soul life versus the life activities, which I'm also talking about here. Um, but it says something interesting. It says that our psyche or soul is not just in the brain or the nervous system. We might think of it as connected to the entire body. We have an embodied soul and the function of the organs, the function of your circulatory respiratory system plays into the different aspects of our soul life. And so when we have disorders in the soul life, depression, anxiety, different mental disorders, uh, it's not enough just to stay with the brain from this way of thinking. We have to start looking at all the organs in the body and their particular function. So these processes are, are something that uh, I discussed last time in the context of what the Austrian philosopher Rudolf Steiner introduced, but they are very old ideas. And um, you know this is an ancient concept, the so-called threefold processes. And um, we see the same kind of threefold idea in Chinese medicine, in Ayurveda with the three doshas, kapha, vata, pitta. We have the same idea in Tibetan medicine with phlegm, wind, and bile. And in Western alchemy, the alchemist Paracelsus in the early 1500s spoke about the tria, tria prima, the three primary principles that he saw is more primary than the principles of, we find from, for example, ancient Greek medicine, earth, water, air, and fire. Um, and he developed a way of, of creating herbal medicines based on extracting these different principles from herbs um, and uh, concentrating them in different ways. So his three principles are the salting principle, which is the principle of crystallization or formation. And that's what we essentially see even in the neurosensory system. Um, you know, I circle here the head, but of course the neurosensory system extends throughout the whole body. We just say it's concentrated at this one pole. And then the processes of metabolism, uh, Paracelsus referred to as sulfur or phosphor, and that's the principle of combustion or metabolism. I think of the combusting of foodstuffs as being related to this, um, creating waste products like carbon dioxide and so forth. And that's really the activities we find centered in the metabolic processes. Um, again, there's metabolic processes, for example, the glial cells, which support the neurons in the, in the brain, are examples of metabolic processes that are projected upward. Uh, but the bulk of them are focused in the metabolic in limb muscle area. And then the third principle, the principle of rhythm, Paracelsus referred to as mercury. He saw it sort of as a balance between uh, moistening and drying. 
Um, and he used the word mercury to describe how the metal mercury essentially can be formed into little balls, more like a head-like gesture, or spread out in a fluid like more the metabolic zone. So essentially, this there's a polarity, a rhythm between uh, these two activities, and uh, that's occurring in the uh, in the circulatory and respiratory zones. Um, and I relate this to the terrain ideas I introduced a few videos ago, which I won't go into, but these are uh, idea based on more of a qualitative physiology. Where we look at qualitative processes like warming or cooling, moistening or drying versus just mechanisms uh, of different diseases. Um, finally, I'll just say here Paracelsus and Steiner and many others have related these three principles to the plant. So in the classic perennial with root processes, blossom, seed, fruit processes, and then stem and leaf processes, we have to look at the salting more as what occurs in the root processes. In fact, we can think of the plant roots like a nervous system reaching out into the soil and sensing. And then the sulfur metabolic activities are occurring up in the blossoms, um, formation of all the oils and the, uh, all the reproductive activities. And then the mercury processes, the rhythms of sap and so forth are in the stem in the leaf. And that's where the photosynthesis occurs. Plants are exhaling oxygen, which we then breathe in. And then we exhale carbon dioxide, which the plant breathes out. We, in the human being, the oxygen is fixed to hemoglobin um, and carried around the body. And then the plant, the carbon dioxide is a fixed, is, is basically fixed. Um, uh, through the capturing of light in chloroplasts and in chlorophyll. And what's interesting in chlorophyll is that the central uh, part of the molecule is sort of an inverse image of hemoglobin. It's basically the same molecule um, uh, as hemoglobin in chlorophyll, uh, but in chlorophyll it contains magnesium versus the uh, molecule in hemoglobin contains iron. And what's interesting is that chlorophyll actually fluoresces in ultraviolet light blood red, and then um, blood fluoresces in ultraviolet light is green. So there's sort of this in, inner reciprocal image between plants and human beings, very beautiful relationship here. Okay, so that's this idea of the threefold processes, which I went into in more depth last. And then finally, I discussed how the fourfold uh, layers of organization that I've been describing, the four fields, if you will, uh, relate to the threefold principles. How, for example, in the head zone, we have more the, the uh, fluid body, the gas light body, and the warmth bodies essentially are working more in a formative way from the outside in. And so we can think of that in the neural tube is, you know, these forces are working from the outside in um, and forming these essentially solid structures. Again, there are hollow spaces in there, the so-called um, cerebral uh, ventricles with cerebral spinal fluid, which is very important. But for, you know, it's just the image here, we can think of it as more solid and the formative forces are working from outside in. Versus in the intestines, the forces are working from inside out uh, into the body, into metabolism, into the will, into the will activities in the psyche. So that's how these uh, relate in the two poles. And then in the respiratory zone, with every systole, that's a contraction of the heart, or every in-breath, which is contraction of the diaphragm, um, we can think of the neurosensory, uh, the rhythmic zone is becoming more head-like. And then in relaxation, in exhalation, when the diaphragm relaxes, and then in diastole, when the heart relaxes, then we can think of the respiratory zone and the rhythmic zone as becoming more uh, related to how the fields are related in metabolism. So more uh, working from inside out. So this is, um, you know, the beautiful kind of relationships here between the different polarities of the body and the, uh, the four layers of organization that I spent many lectures developing. Now, this way, this idea of the three germ layers and the three full principles has found other expressions looking, for example, at human typology looking at the phenotypes, not so much genotypes, but phenotypes. What are the actual physical expressions and outward appearances of human beings? And there have been many that have developed these ideas. So for example, Ernst Kretschmer was a German psychiatrist uh, who um, had this idea of three different constitutional types. He called them the asthenic, the athletic, and the picnic, short and stocky. Um, and then William Sheldon was an American physician, uh, psychologist, who basically um, uh, 
you develop the three types that we now know as the ectomorph, the mesomorph, and the endomorph, named after the three germ layers. Again, the ectomorph is more from the neurosensory zone, the endomorph from the digestive um, activity, and then the mesomorph, the muscle, the more middle, uh, the cardiovascular muscle zone. And these, we can think of them as having three distinct body types, the ectomorph being kind of more lanky and thin, the endomorph being shorter but more stockier, more plump, and then the mesomorph kind of in between the two. And interestingly, there's a similar division within mammals. We can think of rodents, for example, as being more ectomorphic. They really have a very active neurosensory life. The, uh, the ruminants, like cows, for example, have a lot of digestive metabolic activity. And then the carnivores kind of combine both in between. They're more mesomorph in that way. Interestingly, there are three basic categories of birds. There are three basic categories of dinosaurs. So this is sort of a universal archetypal plan within the vertebrate kingdom, but we even see some of it in the um, invertebrates, for example, jellyfish with their sort of rounded bulb and then the kind of uh, the sort of tentacles coming off of it. So the same kind of gestures apply there as well. In Ayurveda, of course, there's the idea of vata, pitta, and kapha, the three body types, and then paracelsus, the salt, mercury, and sulfur, as I just discussed. So this, this is, uh, of course, a, a generalization no one's going to fit into these categories exactly, but we do see, uh, you know, different people have, you know, generally fall into one of these different phenotypes, which gives us an idea about the overarching type of activity that person's going to be more engaged in. So the endomorphs, again, are, have more of this active metabolic activity, building up of substance, storing substance like fat and so forth, versus the ectomorphs tend to be more, more nerve oriented in their activities and then in between the mesomorphs kind of hold the balance. So that's the idea of the three phenotypes. And this is of course, in contrast to a very ancient idea, the so-called four temperaments, which come from more of the fourfold way of thinking. Uh, and this comes to us from Hippocrates. Um, and this is the basis of humoral medicine, which is really a foundation of Western medicine up until the early 1800s. But Hippocrates had the four temperaments of the melancholic based in the earth, or these are people that, that Hippocrates had said had a lot of this particular humor known as black bile circulating around. They were more cold and dry. Some people refer to this as the nervous uh, temperament. The phlegmatics or lymphatics uh, based in the water element or phlegm is the humor described by Hippocrates, which is cold and moist. The sanguines are more based in air and blood. Interestingly, in the old ancient Greek way of thinking, the blood system was um, filled with air, not, not so much blood as we know today. Um, and this was warm and moist in quality. And then the choleric was more, or bilious temperament was more based in fire. And the had a lot of the humor of yellow bile, was more described as warm and dry. And again, the balance of these four humors is what created health or illness. Um, and so, you know, physicians were, you know, doing things to rebalance the humors. The humors were originally thought as more suprasensory activity, but then later uh, going into the 16, 17, early 1800s, they were perceived more and more as physical things, which had to be let out or leached or purged in some way. So that's where we have these bleeding practices and whatnot, which uh, probably end up killing more people than they ended up helping. Um, but these practices um, were based more in a materialistic uh, interpretation of what are essentially dynamic forces. Today, we would describe the humors as your hormones. Essentially, the balance of your different hormonal forces um, is what creates health. And uh, bleeding someone is not gonna balance your hormones, um, basically. Now that's the fourfold way of thinking, but again, we have our threefold way of thinking. So the ectomorphs, we can think of as sort of a combined melancholic phlegmatic. The endomorphs are more of a sanguine choleric, and then the mesomorph, more phlegmatic sanguine. That's one way of maybe linking them together. Um, and then putting them on the kind of wheel of terrain, we can think of the um, you know, melancholics is, is here, and the cholerics is here, and the sanguines more the air light processes, the phlegmatics here, and so forth. So this is, you know, this was helpful to a degree to kind of look at, again, phenotypes and how we might relate them uh, and give us idea about underlying organs or hormone patterns that, that could be important to look at. Uh, I'll be touching on this as we go, but I'm not going to really emphasize temperament thinking or the three phenotype thinking uh, as much as looking at more the dynamic processes that maintain life and how we can begin to grasp an understanding of those.
Finally, uh, last week, I or in the last lecture, discussed this idea of the threefold cell. So this idea with the holo the holography, Kessler's idea, is that essentially each part of the body down to the cells is a reflection of the whole. So the threefold principle, which we can see in the whole body, should be reflected into the cell as well. Cells are images of that. And indeed, we find that. We have a sensory information system. Um, you know, we have information stored in the DNA, RNA in terms of, you know, how do we make proteins? And then we have the membrane itself filled with receptors. We can say that's the true neurosensory zone of the cell. Uh, and then in you know, the certain membranes are folded into microvilli or little folds to increase their surface area for sensing. And then we have once uh, information, maybe a ligand binds to a receptor, it stimulates a whole process of intracellular signaling. So signals go out into the cell, and so there's a signaling system here. And then we have the uh, different transport vesicles, movement of the cytoplasm of the cell itself, phagocytosis, endocytosis, which is related to secretion and excretion, and then the mitochondria, which are the respiratory, the little breathing centers of the cell. That's where oxygen is utilized to um, break down foodstuffs to essentially make ATP energy that the cell can use for other processes. And then there's a metabolism movement system where we make proteins in the structures known as the endoplasmic reticulum and the ribosomes. Um, and then the proteins are often transported to the little Golgi apparatus where we have further protein folding and synthesis. Um, and then uh, maybe that's also where steroids are synthesized um, and they're transported around the cell. And then there's a system of microtubules and cytoskeleton involved in movement and then the centrioles involved in reproduction when the cell divides into two. Um, so these threefold processes are reflected down into cells. Cells, for example, in the nervous system have a lot of membranes, so they have a lot of sensory information activity versus metabolic cells like liver cells, so-called hepatocytes, have a lot of endoplasmic reticulum and ribosomes. And, um, and then cells that are more in the middle, like the heart, cardiac muscle, very rich in mitochondria. So we can almost, by taking a cell from a portion of the body, we can almost see what is the predominant activity in that area of the body based on the actual structure of the cell and uh, knowing these different connections. Now, the topic I wanted to introduce today, um, and uh, this will well, build out further in the coming lectures, is the idea that we can go further than just the threefolding and we can start to look now at seven, the seven processes. And if we just focus on the life activity, these would be activities in the fluid body, the so-called etheric bodies I described, um, there's really seven basic activities to life. And this is, I think, a very crucial idea because it says that we can begin to think of life not as just something from the organs and, and different mechanisms, but as actual functions. And just like the color spectrum with light has a sevenfold relationship, we can say if we divide life activities into their spectrum, they fall out into seven basic uh, activities. If you just type in to an internet search, look at the seven you know, basic life activities, you'll basically get these same seven. So this is a sort of a recognized understanding of biology that when something is alive, it has to have these seven processes that are active in it. And so to understand the seven life processes, it's helpful to start at the layer of the cell, the level of the cell, um, to really, you know, because I think most people are familiar with cell function and activity, this can become more difficult when we begin to look at the whole body and how we see the, the seven reflected there as well. But if we look at uh, cell processes, essentially the first process that has to happen is their cell has to have a boundary. And that is the cell membrane itself. And across this boundary, the cell is able to sense what's happening in the outer world. Um, and that's through, for example, things binding to different receptors, maybe ion channels bringing things across. Um, but basically, there is uh, an outer world and an inner world uh, through this sensing. And this is sort of, we can say, this cell, if it had a sense of self, let's say this is me inside and this is not me, this is environment on the outside. Whenever something crosses a membrane, it has to be often transformed. So for example, if we have a signaling molecule out here and it binds to a receptor. It's going to stop here, but it's going to then stimulate intracellular processes that look very different from that original uh, molecule. And so essentially there's a transformation that has to happen where the outer world comes up to a membrane and then it's transformed into something else. 
And we might think of that as sort of a death process, almost like, for example, in the fall, when we have grain that grows up, we have to kill it. And then we transform that grain in, in, into the processed you know, foods that we want and so forth. So it can carry on a different life. So that's sort of a death of the outer world and an inner transformation into a new life uh, inwardly. So that's what I'm referring to as the sensing activity. Again, once that uh, substance, it could be a signaling molecule, but also maybe a nutrient comes across the membrane. It has to be integrated into the whole of the cell. And that's what I'm calling here integration. Some might refer to this as nutrition, but I, I want to be a little bit broader because cells don't just work with nutrition. They work with sensing as well. We might think of this as more of a thinking process of the cell. The cells have to take that information or those nutrients. They have to process them in different ways, coordinate their movement and activity. Um, and so that's all part of this second life process, integration. A third process would be respiration or breathing. And this is what happens in the mitochondria where oxygen is utilized um, in the process of breaking down things like glucose into ATP. And that's more activating. So now the energy can be used to activate other enzymes and other activities. There's a process of more circulation, which is related to secretion and excretion. Most books just refer to this as excretion. But cells, you know, they excrete into the environment, but they also secrete their own substances as well. Um, and this happens through different transport vesicles and so forth. And then metabolism is, of course, you know, where we are essentially cells are making their own proteins in the ribosomes uh, based on the DNA and RNA templates. Um, and these enzymes drive our biochemistry. And there are different rhythms involved here. Um, in fact, many proteins inside the cell are what we call metalloproteins. They contain metals, for example, magnesium or zinc, selenium as cofactors uh, to allow the enzyme to work. And uh, all of these activities have specific rhythmical activity. And this is also related to nutrition in a different way as well. This is where we're actually building up intracellular nutrients and, and that sort of thing. Um, then there's a movement activity. So all life processes are involved in movement in some way. Uh, but movement we can think of as also having an inner gesture, and that is growth. Um, growth itself is a type of movement, a movement of the cell expanding into something bigger. Uh, and movement usually requires the use of microtubules and the cytoskeleton uh, as part of that movement apparatus. And then cells reproduce, and that's where the DNA is copied, cells divide, uh, and this is part of the regenerative processes. So um, I think of reproduction more broadly here is also including regeneration. Um, just like with movement, we can think of this broadly also including growth. So those are seven life processes. We might think of these first three as more neurosensory or information processing in a way. And these lower three is more metabolic uh, in nature and then more of a rhythm in between. So there's a three folding within that seven that we can find here. So those are the seven basic life processes as reflected in the cell. Now, where it becomes more difficult is, again, if that holography idea is to uh, be valid, we have to be able to see those same seven life processes in the entire human being. So sensing, integration, respiration, circulation, metabolism, movement, growth, and reproduction um, should be also found within the threefolding and the whole human being. And we can kind of get a sense of that. You know, we of course have the heart in the center here with the circulatory system, the lungs more respiratory. Although lungs are an interesting one. We think of lungs as our know, respiration organs. Of course they are. We have oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange. Um, but if we ask really what is respiring, it's more in the cells, the mitochondria, that's the breathing apparatus. The lungs themselves are more related to setting rhythms. For example, the rhythm of peristalsis in the intestines and so forth, we can think of as a sort of lung activity. So again, lungs aren't exactly the same as respiration, but they're certainly involved in the respiratory process. We have sensing and integration, sort of the thinking processes in the nerves. We have our basic metabolic activities, our movement growth, which um, interestingly, we can relate to many different organs. For example, the liver has to maintain muscle, glucose, and activity. But the kidneys are extremely involved in this through the adrenal glands in allowing for movement and growth in general in the body. And then the reproductive organs related there. So in a way, there's sort of a, a seven folding here. And what's very interesting is that these, if we just arrange this sort of pattern here, there's a seven folding within the endocrine system as well, the pineal, 
pituitary, thyroid, parathyroid, thymus, if we think of that as an endocrine gland, the pancreas, the adrenals, and then the, um, the reproductive organs, the, the gonads, ovaries, and testes. So essentially, there's a seven-folding there as well. Very interesting how these principles uh, keep coming back this way, the three-folding and now the seven. Now, the final slide here will maybe be the most difficult to understand, um, but it will form the basis of what I want to explore in coming lectures. And that is the idea that we can take the seven, like I just described, and look at each of the three zones, the neurosensory, the rhythmic, and the metabolic, is also having seven within them. So that's the next layer, the next level of this holarchy. Um, so, for example, looking at the metabolic region and, and basically the organs that, that form nutrition and that nourish the blood and work with that. I'll just call these the blood organs for simplicity. Parallel, contrasted with the nerve organs, we can say there's a seven folding within each. Now, if we begin to, begin to then connect these seven life processes with specific organs, we see very interesting relationships. So for one, I mentioned several slides ago that we can kind of think of the hindbrain, um, the midbrain and the forebrain as having, you know, sort of images of the neural tube in the different parts of the brain, but the different metabolic organs reflect into them um, and, and vice versa. So if we begin to look at the seven life processes in the blood organs, um, versus the nerve organs. Um, in the blood organs, we have, I'll just stay on the left-hand column here, we have our processes in, if that's what is the sensation processes in the, uh, in the metabolic organs. Each of our organ, of course, like the liver, the kidneys, have their own sensory system. So we can say within each organ, there's sensation. But as a whole, the process of, for example, I mentioned in the cell, of bringing nutrients or molecules from the outside of the cell and then transporting them inwardly, but they have to undergo a metamorphosis, a transformation. They have to undergo a sort of death process is exactly what happens in our upper intestines with our stomach and um, our duodenum and pancreas, um, but also within the blood with the spleen. The spleen we think of as primarily as a immune organ filtering the blood. There are white blood cells in the spleen, which are constantly taking out different foreign antigens. But there's a very strong connection with those antigens and where they come from in the digestive tract. So the spleen is sort of a, a digestive organ in this way, but more oriented towards the blood directly. Um, and so the sensation part of the whole metabolic process, and that again, when I talk about sensation as a life process, I'm also talking about the transformation across membranes or transformation of what is outer into inner. In the upper GI tract, we have to basically tear down the foods tear down the uh, starches into glucose. We have to tear down proteins, animal protein, into amino acids uh, and fatty acids, fats into fatty acids. So essentially tear down the outer world, kill it in a certain way, so it can then later be reborn within the human being as our own protein, our own glycogen, our own fats. We can't just take these things from outer nature and not have them be transformed. That actually leads to what we call food sensitivities or different inflammations throughout the body. In fact, a very interesting idea is that inflammation in general can be thought of as, in many cases, as a misplaced digestive process. So what should have happened in the upper intestines with a complete breakdown of the food through the stomach acid and pancreatic enzymes and bile, this is now happening in your sinuses or in your joints or so forth. So it gives an interesting insight into therapy. For a lot of inflammations, we have to start looking at the gut activity and how we can maybe work with that. Similarly, when we break the food down into individual amino acids and glucose and whatnot, then it's got to be absorbed into, most of it's absorbed into what's called the portal vein system. And that goes directly into the liver. And the liver cells now take all those building blocks and they build human proteins, human starch called glycogen, or human fats from those, those materials. So basically, we have to integrate them and then build new things. And the liver and its paired organ, the gallbladder, are involved in this. Um, so that's the second activity. The third activity is respiration, which we, again, we can think of as lung activity in general. But in a, in a more specific sense, respiration, again, is its own activity, a little bit different than the lungs themselves. Um, again, lungs primarily don't deal with oxygen. Uh, if we think of respiration more as an oxygen process here, 
Um, really the primary organs that deal with oxygen are things like the kidneys, but also this weird organ pair I'm gonna talk about in more detail. This comes from Chinese medicine, the idea of what, what they call as the triple warmer and the pericardium. Now these don't exactly, there's no such organ in Western anatomy we know of a triple warmer. And the pericardium that's described in Chinese medicine is a little bit different than the pericardium in biomedicine. Um, but I'll just give them placeholder names for now. We'll have to go into what these organs are. If anything, they correlate more with the sympathetic nervous system and the activities of the thyroid and so forth. So I'll go more into in iron metabolism. So I'll go more into that. But basically respiration, I'm gonna to link to those organs. The lungs primarily deal with carbon dioxide, the waste products of metabolism. So interestingly, the metabolism I'm gonna relate here to the lungs and the large intestine. And again, as I go into each organ, this will make a little bit more sense. Uh, the rhythms of metabolism are maintained, are very tightly uh, linked actually to respiratory rhythms and their activity. Um, circulation, of course, the heart, but then we can think of the small intestine um, as a lower image from the rhythmic zone, if we have the heart here, project that down, we have the small intestine. Projected upward, we have the, uh, the midbrain uh, areas. And uh, so again, there's a relationship between those. The movement growth uh, life process, I'm gonna seat in the kidney um, organ system and this paired organ, the bladder, and the reproductive organs, that one's a little bit more clear, we have in the the reproductive organs themselves, which in the, again, from the Chinese medicine description, this is related to what's called the conception vessel and governing vessels. And I'll talk about what those are as we go through. So seven life processes linked to seven organ processes in the metabolic zone, seven brain processes. Now, interestingly, I've paired these organs based on how they're described in Chinese medicine. This is what we call a yin or solid, more solid organ. And this is this paired more hollow organ. What's interesting about hollow organs is that they are very nerve rich. So they have a very rich nervous system. In fact, we can think of this as more of a neurosensory aspect of the, the, hollow, the solid organ. So for example, the stomach, we usually think of as just a bag that has digestive, you know, the acid and, and basically breaks down proteins and whatnot as we eat them. But we also know that the stomach wall, as well as the wall of the intestines, small and large intestine, even the gallbladder and the bladder, these uh, organ walls are very rich in sensory neurons. And they have, for example, in the intestines, the same uh, taste receptors you have on your tongue, as well as smell receptors. These are little molecular receptors that are found in the olfactory membrane of your nose. Those same molecules, the receptors are found all throughout the gut. So the gut is emerging as a giant sensory organ that has a neurosensory aspect. So that's why we can interestingly think of these hollow organs as more the neurosensory aspect within the metabolic zone of the more blood oriented organs. So again, I'll come back to that theme as we go, but that's a further sort of little subdivision there. And uh, for students of Chinese medicine, this should all make sense because these are very um, well-known discussed kind of ideas. Maybe the only difference would be the relationship with the, the, the nervous system. I will say one thing here in, in Chinese medicine, very little emphasis is given on the head. In fact, most Chinese, if you look at some of the depictions of the organs, they usually leave the head off and just discuss everything below the, the head. Um, and in a way, that's an interesting idea from Western Greek medicine. They thought the head and the brain was an excretion, essentially, of the metabolic zone, more of a waste product. Uh, today, we focus almost entirely on the brain and the head. But in ancient thinking, it was actually the organs which were the most interesting part that they were essentially sensing, just like we sense the outer world through the head and our sensory organs, the uh, organs were sensing, sensing an inner world, more psychic spaces, more that etheric and astral spaces I described. They're essentially antennas for those fields and they bring that information into us in an unconscious or subconscious manner versus up in the head, we have more of a conscious mind. Well, traditional medicines were much more interested in that activity. Um, so we can say that although the, nervous system wasn't discussed as much in Chinese medical thinking, they actually discussed the nervous system through the discussion of the so-called uh, hollow organs. So we can think of these almost as an image of the neurosensory system. And that's why I've put here in the hindbrain, the relationship with the stomach, midbrain, small intestine, forebrain, large intestine, and we can put all the other hollow organs in there as well. Um, so just an interesting idea, again, thinking more metamorphically,
about one how one area or field of activity in the body is a metamorphosis of another field. So that is the seven organ processes as reflected into seven primary organs or 14 if we take the different pairs together. What I want to do in coming lectures is go through each of these pairs and look at them in more detail, um, kind of what their activities are, how we might think of them in different pathologies, and, um, and start opening up the discussion of how we might treat them. And one insight that will come through here is that in my own sort of work with herbs over the years, I've come to an understanding that herb, herbal therapies, as well as therapeutic metals um, prepared in the right way, um, are really working on the fields of the organs as a whole, not on individual mechanisms within that organ. So an herb like milk thistle, for example, is supporting the whole liver field, not just uh, you know one little mechanism. So that's a different way of thinking because we usually think in terms of you know molecules within herbs as supporting specific mechanisms within a cell. But if we back up in our thinking, we say they're also supporting the fields that maintain the different organs in their activity. And so these activities can be strengthened through different herbal therapies prepared in the right way. And again, also therapeutic metals. Um, so that's something which I'll be going into in a series of seven lectures here, going into each organ system in its, in its pair. Now, one final note I'll make is notice I've sort of looked here at the neurosensory aspect, the nerve aspect, and the blood aspect, but I left out the rhythmical aspect. And the question is, is there a sevenfold division within the rhythmical system? Uh, of course, heart and lungs are part of that. But if we look at what are the organs that sort of maintain the blood in a rhythmical way, uh, that is the endocrine system. So the endocrine system really fits in between here, between the blood organs and the nerve, uh, the nerve organs. Um, and uh, so through each hormone, we can find each gland is essentially uh, roughly correlated with the different organ. Now, these are rough correlations because many of these functions, these life processes are carried between one or more organs. And so it's not always easy to, uh, to see the distinctions. And each organ contains each of the seven as well. So there's a sensory aspect in the liver, an integrative aspect, a respiratory aspect, circulatory aspect, and so forth. And so we can do further and further subdivisions within uh, these different organs as well, if you want to. Usually for clinical practice, we don't have to go into that much detail, but that is certainly a possibility. Um, so the endocrine processes have rough correlations with the organs. We can see, for example, in the kidney, in case of the kidney, that's pretty easy, correlation there with the adrenal glands. Um, in the case of the liver and the gallbladder, that's going to be a little bit more difficult, but that um, has a strong correlation with the hypothalamus and pituitary um, and so forth. And so uh, I'll go into some of those uh, pairings as we go through the different seven different systems. Um, okay, so that's the idea of seven life processes, seven life functions, which really brings a new insight into salutogenic medicine. It says we're not so much trying to treat mechanisms or even organs per se, but rather support life functions. And that a disease can be thought of as a breakdown in one or more of those life functions or activities. And then we can find from nature different substances that can support uh, in the right way the uh, distorted life activity. And again, where does that light activity come from? You know, in our current view, we think of it as just, well, we have these organs and they take food and they make energy and that's where things come from. But in the ancient view, the organs were thought of as actually receivers, antennas, if you will, for fields beyond the physical. So essentially they are receiving different aspects of the etheric and the astral fields uh, and then bringing those into the human being. I'll just leave that there as more of a thought, um, and that's more metaphysical speculation on my part, like a lot of this might be to some, um, but you know, trying to find the correlations between these ideas and again, always trying to link it back to what is quantitative and observable and measurable so that we can then maybe form new hypotheses and then test them uh, in different ways. And that's ultimately what we have to keep in mind is that we can speculate all we want, but they have to be, these ideas should be brought back to more uh, quantitative or you might call scientific thinking so that we can, um, you know, test them in different ways, but they should hopefully help us form new hypotheses and inspire different ideas in therapy for how we might support patients better. Okay, so that's all I wanted to cover in this lecture. As always, please share and like if you like the content, 
and uh, subscribe to the channel if you want to hear more of these videos. And uh, I will start in the next uh, lecture, a discussion of the spleen and stomach and the uh, life processes associated with sensation and transformation.